Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I share my recent appearance on the University of Applied Research and Development's Educators Videocast, where I talk about making a difference, the award-winning programs that I'm a part of at UVU, and the local, national, and international impact my students are making in the world. Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development's video cast, and we're delighted to have with us Dr. Jonathan Westover, who is the Professor and Chair of Organizational Leadership at Utah Valley University. Welcome. Thank you. It is a real pleasure and honor to be able to join you today. I appreciate the invitation. We'd love to have you share with us your role and what you do with the university. Yeah, you know, I've I've uh, been at UVU, uh, which for anyone who may know U.S. geography a little bit, we're about 45 minutes south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, Salt Lake City is where the 2002 Winter Olympics were held. Um, so it's the largest, largest public university in the state of Utah and one of the largest in the country. Uh, so it's just a massive university. Um, and I've been there for 11 years. I teach in the organizational leadership department and I'm department chair. I teach human resource management, organizational behavior, organizational development and change management, ethical decision-making, and social impact courses. Uh, and I've been doing you know, that for a long time. I also, you know, as academics, we, we teach and we do research and we do service. That's usually the three buckets of activities that we um, talk about. Uh, I do a lot of research in the areas of global uh, comparative international studies, uh, specifically looking at the nature of work, the shifting nature of work, uh, employee motivation, engagement, satisfaction, uh, those sorts of topics. So I, I like to use, uh, I, I do some original um, data collection myself, but I also use some of the big data sets that are out there that are just readily available. Um, so the International Social Survey is one of them, um, and there's the last wave of the International Social Survey uh, that looked at work uh, included 37 countries. And so there's, and, and there's some tremendous variables in there. So there's so many really interesting things you can look at and examine, uh, and you can make cross country comparisons, and then you can add on uh, country contextual factors to look at cultural differences and geopolitical socioeconomic differences that are driving the nature of work uh, across the world. And you can go back over time. So you can look, you know, the, the International Social Survey started in uh, the 80s. And so really over the last 30 plus 40 years, um, you can look at shifts and trends in the nature of work. So it's, it's a really uh, fascinating data set. I've done a lot of work with it. The nice benefit of something like that is, you know, there, I could never on my own collect that data. Um, data collection is really difficult and I do collect a lot of data, uh, but you just, collecting that kind of cross-national data is really impossible for an individual person to do. And so these types of international consortiums are, are really great. Uh, the World Value Survey is something, another data set I've used a little bit uh, and several others that I've, uh, that I've utilized over the years. And really the bottom line is, I just want to better understand the nature of work, how it shifts over time, and what motivates and drives employees to be their most productive, their most successful, uh, and to find meaning and purpose in their work. 
Uh, so that's that's a little bit about the main area of research that I do. Uh, another, I wouldn't say tangential, but a little bit off to the side is I do a lot of pedagogy-based research. Uh, I do uh, particularly in the areas of experiential learning. So I, in addition to being um, the the department chair of the organizational leadership department, I'm also the academic director of our university's Center for Social Impact. And uh, as a part of that role, I oversee all of the service learning courses across our campus. So these are, are uh, courses where teachers have the students go out into the community, often doing consulting projects for organizations, um, or in some way, you know, providing benefit into the community through the learning that they're doing in the course in applied projects. And so this type of experiential learning is a tremendous way for students uh, to reinforce their learning and, and have career preparation. Uh, it, of course, gives back to the community and provides a lot of community benefit, has lots of university benefits. Uh, and so I do a good amount of research around pedagogy and around experiential learning and some of the outcomes and the benefits of all of that. Um, those are really my two main areas of research. And then on the service side, you know, I, I do all sorts of things in terms of different committees that I, I serve on and do work with, um, but then I also do professional service, you know, at the state, national, and international levels, and uh, find a lot of value in serving professionally in in that way in a variety of different roles. Um, really, you know, it's it's a fun thing to be, you know, doing um, uh, being a, a scholar practitioner like I like to consider myself, um, being enmeshed in the research, understanding. The, the methodology and trying to drive best practice through the research, uh, but then making it like translating it over to practitioners so that they can utilize it. Uh, I do consulting also on the side. And so I have my own consulting firm, Human Capital Innovations. I have my own podcast, the Human Capital Innovations podcast that you're welcome to check out. And I interview uh, practitioners, organizational leaders, uh, industry experts from around the world. Uh, who share their insights, their experiences, and I try to pull in some of my research, and we just try to have a dialogue. And, you know, I, I think sometimes there's just a, a, a mismatch. Sometimes there's a, a breakdown in communication between the scholars and the practitioners. So I like to consider myself as someone who can kind of bridge that gap uh, and go into both worlds and hopefully provide some good benefit um, to the community uh, through that work. So in a really big nutshell, I would say that's kind of what I'm doing. I just want to ask, what do you see as the value for those in professional circles to um, pay attention to and learn from the data and scholarship and research? Because from, from what I see, there is a disconnect, as you've just said. Yeah, well, there's definitely a disconnect. In part, it, it's because of the pace of academic research. So there's just a lag. Uh, when we do academic research, because it just takes so long, especially if you're collecting your own data, you have to design the study, you have to then get IRB approval, you have to go collect the data, analyze the data, write up the, the, the research, submit it to journals, that can take, you know, a year or two sometimes just to get through the publication process. And so there's always a bit of a lag in terms of what industry is doing or trying to do versus what the scholars are uh, examining in their research. So I think that's one reason is, is uh, practitioners often just feel like, you know, this, this academic stuff, it's nice, but it's kind of, it's the ivory tower disconnected um, theory. And, and we need like practical practice. We need to be able to, to actually do, do the work. Um, and so one thing that we can do in academia is simply find ways to speed up the process, not to decrease the, uh, the quality, but, you know, is it really necessary to take two years to go through a peer review process and have an article come out in a journal? I don't think it is. Um, and I think, I think over the last decade, we've started to see improvements in terms of uh, that process and, and the speed at which things can go through rigorous peer review and then get disseminated. Uh, but then you also, I mean, how many organizational leaders are sitting down reading journal articles? right? That almost never happens. I'm sure there are some, and you hear about, sometimes you hear about a PhD who goes off and becomes a CEO somewhere. They might be more inclined to do something like that. 
but they're busy. They don't have time to wade through. And they oftentimes they don't even know, they wouldn't even know what they're reading, um, you know, in terms of the statistics and the methods and all of that. And so there needs to be a step where we take the, the academic published materials and then more or less translate it into practitioner speak, right? Where we can actually um, take the, the, the key learnings from this new research that was been done, that, that has been conducted um, it's rigorous. It's been vetted. It's been peer reviewed. We know we can um, we can trust it, and and then pull out that key information that can have meaning and value for organizational leaders. And there's just there's not a lot of people doing that kind of bridge building work. Um, I think I think it's a real blue ocean. Actually, I think it's it's a really a great opportunity for people who who want to try to bridge that gap. Um, but there's not a lot of people doing it and it's because it's hard work. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to, you can, you can make money and, and uh, make a name for yourself without having to do the hard work of all of this academic research. Right. So you have the big consultancies, for example, they, uh, they, they do some really great work. Don't get me wrong, but they, they make their money because they're selling expertise because they're selling the secret sauce because they have the the model that will fix everything for for your organization if you hire this consultant to come in and you know that's just not how science works um there's no one size fits all there's no magic bullet there's no model that you can apply from whatever consulting firm that's magically going to fix your organization it's it's just not how it works and but a lot of organizational leaders Kind of fall into the trap of of believing in what I maybe this is maybe being a little bit harsh, but uh, but I I sometimes even see it as like a snake oil salesman, someone who who is um, um, you know consultants. If they're not careful, they can kind of become like snake oil salesmen, and and they're basically selling a solution that doesn't have any possibility of actually having the impact they claim it's going to have. Um, so anyways, we need to, we need to make the connection between research driven types of, um, interventions, um, that can actually drive results for real organizations, real practitioners doing the real work and we can do it, but it just, it takes patience. It takes concerted effort. Um, and that's something that isn't always there. I know in the U S you know, we were really short term oriented. Um, and to, to have an organization that's willing to put the money, not just the money, but the time to put the time behind a really rigorous type of, um, organizational intervention, um, diagnosis, uh, and understanding the, the systemic issues of the organization and how to resolve them. You know, it, you just don't see that very often because in, you know, in the U S in particular, because we're, we have such a short term orientation. We tend to be focused on quarterly earnings and um, the, the stock sh uh, uh, shareholder um, types of concerns and, and stock prices and those sorts of things. And that's all that's all fine and good. We, we, we do want successful organizations, but it's one thing to work towards, you know, long term sustainable success of an organization versus doing whatever it takes to make the organization look good right now so I can get my quarterly earnings bonus or whatever. Um, so sometimes there's just a disconnect, I think. Yeah, I agree. And it's quite clear that you're doing regular research and publishing a lot. And I do want to say congratulations I saw you post about the National Science Foundation, the award that you won. How about you tell us about that? Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that that is breaking news. Um, just just uh, a couple hours ago, I I was pleased to get that uh, award notification email in my inbox, and you know, I I, I actually knew it was coming, um, but I, I wasn't quite sure when. And we've been working on it for like three years. We've been trying to get it ready. And as these things happen, you know, it, it tends to go through rounds of kind of review and revision 
and those sorts of things. So for about three years, we've been preparing this project, um, trying to get funding through the National Science Foundation uh, for an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary project uh, that will involve our undergraduate and graduate students at the university being mentored by faculty experts doing community-based research and experiential service learning in the community to try to understand the, the facets of um, health uh, and uh, benefit to uh, a lake that's, uh, the name of the lake is Utah Lake. And so we're in Orem, Utah, if you wanna you know, look it up on a map. We're in Orem, Utah, we're actually a lake town. Um, we have a massive lake, but it's, it's quite polluted and it's not very usable. Uh, and it used to be, it used to be generations ago, people would use that lake and there was lots of industry around it. There was lots of recreation around it. And now um, because uh, in part, there was an, an old um, uh, steel factory that was on the shores of the lake that polluted a lot of it. Um, that has since gone away and has been largely cleaned up but now we have a lot of problem with algae blooms and those sorts of things, which makes it unhealthy to recreate in. And so a lot of the businesses around the lake that were around recreation broke down and, and went away long ago. And so we're, we're doing this uh, interdisciplinary uh, study and involving students in this community-based research to try to figure out how can we revitalize the lake? How can we revitalize the health of the lake uh, in terms of taking care of the algae bloom issues, the ecological types of elements of, of, of lake uh, health, uh, but also the social elements. Uh, we have social scientists involved in the project as well. Um, myself, uh, you know, as one of the uh, primary investigators, um, looking at the business side of it. And so, you know, I'm really excited. It's, it's going to be a great project, hopefully make a real difference in our community uh, by, by, helping us figure out how we can better uh, clean up and leverage this really great resource that we have right there that is just not being utilized uh, and not really being, we're not benefiting from it in any way. And, uh, and at the, in the meantime, while we're doing that, we're mentoring students, we're helping them develop skills, professional skills, research skills, we're giving back um, to a bunch of you know, the community at large, but also um, a bunch of uh, partner organizations that also do work with the lake. Um, and so it's just this really great collaboration that hopefully will have some really great outcomes. So I'm super excited about it. Thanks for asking about that. About the service learning, uh, in my own research, I found that um, when students who are learning in an institution, maybe in the high tech, animation, movie making, um, coding, when they go and do internships, which I know is different than service learning, but internships and organizations, we need to make sure they're educated about their rights and what sort of responsibilities the organization should have for them. What are some of the things that you uh, make sure that your students know when they're going out in the service learning situations to make sure they're safe, they're cared for, they're getting value for their time? That's a great question. Um, and I suppose there could be a really long answer to it. Uh, it's something when we, when we do faculty development, uh, I, I train the faculty on our campus who do service learning courses, and we ha we have a, a whole unit just on talking about risk, um, risk management, and some of that has to do with liability issues, but it also has to do with uh, safety and health of students and of the community partners. Um, and so, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a complex question, actually. Uh, but I think the bottom line is we need to make sure that our faculty are aware of both, you know, legal issues in terms of uh, laws in the community, but also uh, policy uh, at the university. We need, and we always need to be thinking about how do we make sure the students are, are safe in, in what they're doing and how do we make sure that we, we benefit the community uh, and uh, at a minimum, at least do no harm in the community because sometimes even our best intentions you know in a service learning type of experiential learning you know environment it, it could still have negative consequences if we're not careful so we have to be thoughtful about that we need to be committed to this principle of do no harm uh, we need to make sure that we're talking with our community partner organizations who are the living experts they they know you know so it's 
we have faculty, you know, we're, we're uh, research experts as faculty members and mentors on this NSF project, for example. But there are these other, um, these other nonprofits and other community organizations that are going to be partnering with us. And they're the ones that have been doing work with the lake for years and even decades. So, I mean, it would be kind of stupid. It would be silly of us to try to just go in and think, we're going to fix it. We're going to solve this problem just all on our own, just because we got some money from the, the NSF. No, we need to go and talk to the living experts. We need to go talk to the community partners. We need to understand what the challenges are that they see and understand, and then try to build on their understanding with some of the research background and rigor that we have, um, and then bring the students along, you know, and, and help train them and, and help them understand how they can be successful um, while protecting their safety and health. And I think not only is there a potential safety issue with this particular project because of the algae bloom and, and some of the toxins in the lake that we need to be careful about and there's protocols to deal with that, um, but also we're in the middle of COVID right now. And so I know, for example, with um, what I was planning on doing with a bunch of my students was to go around and do interviews uh, with a bunch of the local businesses that are around the lake and to, to see, you know, how would things change if the lake were revitalized? What, how would that impact them? What, what, in what ways would they change their business? Uh, those sorts of things. We have a whole series of questions we want to ask, but you know what, in the time of COVID, we, we're not going to be going, you know, doing face-to-face -face interviews um, just because that's not prudent. Um, so we definitely have to be very thoughtful about that. And it's, it's up, you know, I, I, I play the role of training the faculty and, and part of training faculty is helping them understand they then need to train their students. They, part of coaching and mentoring the students is help the faculty need to make sure the students understand also what it means to do no harm, what it means, you know, the liability issues, the legal issues, um, that kind of stuff, but also how they can protect themselves, how they can avoid being exploited, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff is, is very, very important. Dr. Jonathan, in the last couple of minutes that we have together, I'd love for you to share some career advice for aspiring leaders, those that are wanting to move to that next step in their career. Yeah, you know, I, like I said a little bit earlier, there's, there's no silver bullet to success. Uh, there's no silver bullet to organizational success, and there's certainly no silver bullet to individual and personal success. Uh, each of us has our own journey, our own path. And, you know, I, I think an important thing to remember, and it, maybe it sounds a little trite, but we need to, to understand where our strengths lie. We need to build on our strengths, and we need to try to do, at least in part, what we feel passionate about. Uh, you know, I love my job as a professor. Now, that's not to say that there aren't parts of my job that I find tedious and annoying. Like, there, I, I'm not a big fan of grading papers, right? Uh, that's not my favorite thing to do. But overall, I love my job and I'm passionate about my job and I find a lot of meaning and purpose in it. Um, so we're, I'm not talking about you, you can only do things that you're passionate about. That's silly. Um, and and that's a bar that's way too high that almost nobody's ever going to reach. But we can find ways to find meaning and purpose in what we're doing. And when we are when we have that passion, when we have that drive and that that intrinsic motivation that's pushing us to to succeed, um, then that that will help us find greater value in what we're doing. It will help us make a bigger impact. It, it just will. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I was one of those people, I, as an undergrad student, I switched majors a bunch of times, trying to figure myself out, try to, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what I was good at, you know, what my future would look like. And it took me a long time to figure that out. And even once I got into grad school and then a PhD, you know, it, you know, I, I had kind of my, my mindset of what I thought a successful life would be what i thought a successful career would be and just like pretty much all of us do i end up having this kind of meandering path and that's okay so but what i what i've learned about myself over time is that i need to be true to myself i need to be authentic 
to, to what I feel is important. And when I do that, then I can have sustainable effort towards whatever I'm doing. Uh, you know, I, I think of some of the things I majored in before, before I landed, you know, where I did accounting was one of them. I was actually really good at accounting. Um, I, I do a lot. Of, I'm a data wonk. I do a lot of statistics. I'm, I have a very analytical mind. I was actually really good at accounting, but I turns out I didn't like it at all. And I couldn't imagine myself doing that for the rest of my life. So God bless those who love accounting and want to do that, but it just wasn't for me. And so I figured that out. And and because I figured that out, and over time, I, I learned to listen to myself, and I learned to to recognize, you know, my internal drivers. That I, I've been able to to move in directions where I can be creative and innovative, and and find a lot of of joy in what I'm doing each and every day. And that that leads to sustainable effort over time. If I would have done accounting, because again, that wasn't being authentically true to myself. You know, I could have been successful at it, um, but I, I suspect my my attention and my energy, my motivation would have waned over time, which probably would have had negative consequences for my career. Uh, and so, I, you know, if we want to move into leadership opportunities, you know, figure out why. What, what's driving you to move into leadership opportunities? Uh, is it just for money and prestige? Because because if that's the only reason, you you know, it may not be for you. Um but if you if you want to move into leadership because you want to empower people, you want to um, teach and train and lift people around you and and have a team, you know, where you develop synergies and and innovate together and come up with really great solutions to complex problems. If that's why you want to be a leader, then absolutely chase that down. Go after it. Um, get training, get, you know, that might be a formal degree that might just be listening to Ted talks, reading books, whatever, um, get some practice. You know, you don't have to be an executive in an organization to get leadership experience. There's lots of opportunities to get leadership experience. Um, it starts in the home, uh, but also in your community, there's lots of nonprofits that could use good people in leadership positions, you know, look, look for opportunities to, to, to serve. And you'll, you'll have opportunities to lead. And uh, ultimately, I'm a big believer in, in what's called servant leadership theory. And in practice, I believe that the best leaders are those who are servant leaders, those who, uh, who don't put themselves above their team. They don't view themselves as higher than. They see, but they see their position as giving them a unique opportunity to better serve and lift and develop people on their team, ultimately with the goal of helping every single person on their team become better than they are. Um, if that's what's motivating you, then go for it. Go for leadership positions. But if it's just you know to get power, prestige, a little bit more money, chances are that's going to end up ringing a bit hollow in the end. And leadership's hard. You know, I I can't imagine wanting to be a leader of any, you know, particular, you know, uh, responsibility level, you know, when you're expect in, in a modern day organization, where oftentimes you're working 70, 80 hours plus a week, you, you bear all the legal responsibility and liability. You, you have, you oversee all these problems with your employees. And if you don't have a service mindset, man, that's a rough gig. Um, and it's pressure that you feel each and every day. It never leaves your shoulders. It's always there. It's always pressing down on you. So you have to have a, 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 a bigger purpose behind why you wouldn't want to take on a leadership role. Um, and fortunately, there are many leaders who recognize that. They understand that. And that's exactly why they do what they do. Uh, unfortunately, there are many who do it because of the power, the prestige, uh, the money. And those tend to be the really horrible bosses. They're the ones that people hate. People can't stand to work for. They're the ones that drive the best people out of the organization, you know, who leave looking for something better. Um, so those, those are a few thoughts. I think that's a great quote that joy leads to sustainable effort. I think that's brilliant. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Jonathan, for your time. Really appreciate you sharing your wisdom. Appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. I really appreciate it.
we are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.